Hello, John Terrell here. Pull a chair up to the fireside at Chateau Cube, where we discuss life, limited magic, and cube draft. Today we welcome Gwen Decker back to the podcast. Gwen is the founder and lead developer of Cube Cobra, which is an open source cube management website. He is also a fellow organizer of KubeCon, a competitive cubing event that we have postponed due to the coronavirus. Gwen and I sat down for a long conversation, which I broke into two more digestible parts. The first bit you may already have heard, as it is the subject of episode three of Chateau Cube, in which the two of us talk about our cubes that were featured on MTGO. In the second part, we discuss Cube Cobra challenges, features, and future. I am particularly interested in how Cube Cobra allows me to explore a new design space. I am delighted to welcome Gwen Decker to Chateau Cube. Gwen, welcome back to Chateau Cube. We talked last time about our respective cubes that are going to be on MTGO and the design philosophy that animates them. Today, I wanted to take advantage of your expertise in Cube Cobra, since Cube Cobra is your baby. So I want to focus the discussion really on this awesome tool for cube designers. Before we get there, though, let's maybe spend just a little bit more time with your cube in particular and do a pack one, pick one from a a random sample pack that you've generated on Cube Cobra in point of fact. So let's see what we got. So I have a Nature's Chant, which is a very flexible sideboard card that can fit in a lot of decks. Overgrown Tomb, which is great fixing. Silverblade Paladin, a solid white threat. Serendip Afrit, Enclave Cryptologist, Gravecrawler, Irrigated Farmland, Elish Norn, Skymarcher Aspirant, Monastery Swift Sphere, Goblin Dark Dwellers, Dragon Hunter, Figure of Destiny, Supreme Will, and Voracious Hydra. When I see this pack, there's not a lot of clear cards that really pull me in. Usually I like to stay flexible and also go with the powerful card. I think I'm leaning mostly towards Supreme Will. Hmm. I'm happy playing that in basically any blue deck because it's a modo spell and it's an instant. You can make use of it in any deck, but it's really close. I think Elish Norn is also one of the strongest top end cards in the actual cube. So that might be my second choice, depending on how I'm feeling. It does really lock you in trying to get to seven mana one way or another, or trying to cheat it out, or trying to play like a control deck. But it's just so powerful, I feel like it might be worth it. And then after that, I'm going to go with the Overgrown Tomb, just because the having a Shockland early is so valuable. Because even if I don't commit to both these colors, if I'm in a black-white deck and I... I see a Misty Rainforest. Now this Misty Rainforest can fetch my Overgrown Tomb. The dual lands that have the basic land types, incredibly valuable. It it gives you extra flexibility in in the draft on what colors you want to commit to. And I I think that's super valuable. That's why I like the Shock Lands so much. That's awesome. You're on Supreme Will, Elish Norn, Overgrown Tomb. I like it. I like Supreme Will a lot as well. That's a super cool card. That's a three mana mana leak, but it's got the second mode. Look at the top four cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom in any order. So it's an impulse as well for three mana. And that flexibility is so good. My pack one, pick one here. In fact, my first two picks are probably just going to be the lands. I I take Overgrown Tomb and then Irrigated Farmland. Irrigated Farmland, there is a real cost that it comes into play tapped. I don't love that. But the fact that it cycles is amazing. And Watsi, please finish the cycle of these cycling (laughs) duels. I want the enemy colored ones. After the lands, the choices get more interesting. And I would take Figure of Destiny. My reasoning is Figure of Destiny is an excellent aggro card that slots into red or white aggro. And there's a number of red and white aggro cards that surround Figure of Destiny. So there's Dragon Hunter and Sky Marcher Aspirant as some white one drops. There's Silverblade Paladin who seems fine in white weenie strategy in your environment. I'd run him if I picked him up. And then in red, there's, well, there's fewer, but there's Monastery Swift Spear. Anyway, Figure of Destiny is, I think, the best of these, the one I want most of all of these. And I'm going to wheel something. 
I, I think I take figure and then figure I'm going to remain open to the possibility of either being red or white aggro and getting something back. Nice. Well, let's talk about Cube Cobra. I guess a word of backstory here. We got in touch. It must have been in the summer of 2019. Yeah, it was very early on in the development of Cube Cobra. I can probably look it up on Twitter, actually. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Go back to our Twitter chat log. That's amazing. Technology. Yeah, so that that was super cool. Gwen had, he was in the throes of developing this awesome tool. And at the time I was on Cube Tutor, like everybody else is a cube management platform. And Gwen's like, I've got this exciting thing that has all of these awesome features and it's going to be even better than Cube Tutor. <laughs> and I mean, indeed it is. I, I wholeheartedly endorse Cube Cobra. I did a review of Cube Cobra as a video for Cultic Cube, and it was a positive review to my mind. I, I mentioned some of the things that seemed like they weren't quite there yet with respect to Cube Cobra in comparison to Cube Tutor. And my goodness, it's been however many months it's been now, been 10 months or whatever, Cube Cobra has development on it has progressed at a lightning pace such that not only have all of my reservations been uh, dispensed with, but in fact, Cobra's just got all of these other exciting new things that I never would have dreamed of. I'm super excited about the platform and I'm, a, um, I'm an acolyte of, of the Cobra now. The the video um, review didn't actually get made until August, and uh, I think we might be uh, due for another <laughs> another review. Yeah. What, what do you say? Yeah, we probably are for sure. I was on vacation, I recall, so I didn't get around to doing that review for a while. It's true, and I was having so much fun with the website, but I was trying to interact with it on my cell phone, and I had no like cell service, and it was just it was a frustrating thing. But I was super excited about it. And the mobile experience back then was so much worse. And it by no means is excellent today, but we've worked really hard to specifically improve the mobile experience. Yeah, so so this summer, uh, that that summer, I that was like my full time thing, and I, I I must have worked like eighty hours a week on this thing, just hammering out what what I refer to as this minimum viable product. And it was towards the end where I went public with it. I, I started posting on Reddit. The feedback was so overwhelmingly positive. It, it, it was, I mean, I've never experienced anything like it. Just so many people came out and said, man, I've been waiting for this for so long. You know, we've been really needing something to replace KubeTutor, which has really been, has not been being maintained for the last uh, few years. That, that wasn't specifically a hole I was trying to fill. That I, I kind of just accidentally stumbled upon it because when I started Cube Cobra, I, I thought that I was not a fan of Cube Tutor for some reasons. And I was kind of staunchly in the camp of Excel for Cube management. And I used Cube Tutor to like share my lists and, and whatnot. My original idea was I wanted to make this offline app to replace Excel for Cube management. But I'm so glad I didn't. I stumbled upon uh, the technology stack I did and made it a web app. <laughs> Otherwise, well, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. And I got a lot of developers reaching out to me saying, I I think it's an interesting project. Is this open source? So I want I want to contribute. And that that was new to me as well. Not only had I not managed an open source project like this, I hadn't even contributed to another open source project before. So this whole this whole thing was so foreign to me. But I, I figured with the number of people reaching out, because it was probably at that point, I had about a dozen people reaching out. So I figured, OK, well, let's do this. Let's see what happens. And th that was by far the best decision I could have made with, with the website. The, the rate of development uh, after open sourcing has just been incredible. The new technologies people have approached me with saying, hey, I want to use this technology. The, the knowledge that the other contributors bring it just so far exceeds what I'm able to bring to the table. And it's like Cucurba, it, it is a, it's grown far beyond just a passion project of a sole developer. Like this is literally built by the, the Cuban community for the commu Cuban community. Like, and I, I think that's incredible. Nobody's 
getting paid for this work. They're all just volunteering their time. That's pretty spectacular. I mean, I, I, I don't make money off Cube Cobra either, I should say. All the money I make through Patreon and affiliate, it goes straight back into the hosting budget. I would like to grow it more, grow out the infrastructure and be able to do more things. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't really want to be like begging for Patreon donations. Like I, I have a $1 tier with the most basic reward I can think of. And that that's one of my um, philosophies in managing this website. I don't want to hide anything behind a paywall. I, I don't want people to feel like they're getting half the experience they could be. If I build a feature, I, I want everyone to be able to use it. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. And I can totally understand that. That tension that you're describing, I I mean, I feel the same way. Not that I'm doing the same sort of thing at all, but in my content creation work, I want my content to be accessible to everybody. So I have a Patreon and I super appreciate my patrons. That is totally awesome. And I want to provide perks to them but not at the expense of a content that I'm providing to other people. You know, I want access to the content to be democratic, which is precisely what you're doing here. Some things I appreciate about Cube Cobra are I love how I can customize in a really deep way how I am interacting with the cube and looking at the cube. So this means not only that I can sort the cube in all sorts of different ways, I can also present it like physically on the screen in all sorts of different ways. There's not only the visual spoiler and the table view, but there are these other kinds of views too, like the list view and so on, which is super cool. And it's super easy to modify all sorts of aspects of cards by just like clicking on the card and I can change the CMC of a card. I can change the type of a card. And this may sound like a crazy thing, like, why would you change the type or the CMC of a card? Porcelain Legionnaire, I've made it a colorless two drop. Or a Shriek Ma, I've made it a two mana black sorcery. Ancestral Blade, we were just talking about. Uh, it's one and a white for this equipment. When it enters, it creates a one one white soldier and you attach this equipment to it and it, it gives it plus one plus one. So it's effectively a white bear, but when the creature dies, you can re-equip this thing. Anyway, I made it a creature, you know, it enters the battlefield as a bear. So that's super cool. And then another thing that I love is the analysis You've got all of these different kinds of analysis that not only show you curve and so on, but oh my gosh, you've been developing all sorts of new tools here that are super awesome. Another contributor had come in and he had this really um, ambitious vision for analytics. And he said, well, I want to be able, you know, being able to have the user customize what they're looking at. And he built this really elaborate system where users could slice their cube and view all these different types of analytics. It was technically impressive, but I felt like it had a lot of user experience issues. And a lot of people didn't really know what they were looking at or like what features were there. I stepped in and I reworked it again. And it kept almost all the technology that that contributor had written, except I reorganized it in a way that I think it makes more sense to the for non-technical users. I see. A, I heard a lot of people saying it's so awesome that you added this in the last recent update. Well, really, that's actually been around for a while. I just kind of <laughs> yeah. reworked it to make it a bit um, more easy uh, to access and, and to understand. That's awesome. And that that's actually I've had a really good reception for that. So the averages table, um, the design of it goes for all the analytics. I want everything to be super modular, super flexible. So I can order by whatever category I want. And this uses the same system as the table sort, which was um, kind of like the premier feature I, I launched KubeCobra with, which is you have all these different categories and there's different ways to slice your cube. So if in table view, you can set your primary sort to, I don't know, let's say set. Now every I'll have a column for each set and I can see what set all my cards are from in, in a really visual way. And I, and I can do the same thing in analysis. If I do order by set, I can see I have M15. I can see I have two cards from M15 and uh, the average CMC is five. Uh, one thing I like to do is, is use the characteristic for price. And now I can do something like color for the order by, and I can compare the average price for the different cards and for the different colors in the cube. And that's super interesting. 
I see your cube. The average white card is 382, but the average okay. red, uh, the average green card is 666. So oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. What what does that tell us? Is does that mean that maybe the green cards are better? Maybe it just means that a lot of the good white cube cards are I don't know. If I change it to Elo, so the character is Elo, I can now see that white is actually substantially lower than all the other colors for your cube. I have an average Elo of 1280, where green has an average Elo of 1370, and that is indicative of card quality. Uh, so for for some context, Elo is a a uh, ranking system originally designed for chess, and it it works with um, games that have discrete winners. How how it works is we actually implemented where during the draft when you pick a card, it has it simulates like a game between that card and every other card in the pack. The card you picked is the winner, and all the other cards are the loser. And then each card has a side wide elo associated with it. And so every time a human player drafts, these elos get adru- adjusted. What's interesting about it is it's better than just average pick order. So pick order is what we had before ELO, and it didn't do well across all contexts because you have some environments like a popper cube where there are commons that are always first picks, but then they were coming up as higher pick order than some like vintage cube staples, which was very odd to see. But the way ELO works is that card scales in respect to the ELO of its environment. If you do it across all cubes, if you have enough data, you actually will have um, contextualized data and and it works quite well. I wonder if it's true on average across cubes in general that white is going to have a lower ELO and blue is going to have a higher ELO. I mean, that seems like an old saw of cube. I mean, this is received wisdom that white cards suck and blue cards are amazing, right? Well, let's go look at my cube and see how my ELO how my average ELO by color looks like compared to yours. See, my average white ELO is also the lowest at 1250. And then it's red, which your average ELO is also red. And then black, which is the same as you. And then green, which is the same as you. Then colorless, then blue (laughs) at number one. (laughs) Uh, One one thing is interesting. the, The delta between blue and white for your cube is basically identical. I have one... 1380 to 1260, you have 1410 to 1280. So the, the delta is the same. Wow, that's crazy. Despite the fact that our environments are, you know, quite different in many respects. I, and th- that might just be, you know, by chance. I, I, I don't yeah. know if I'd look into it too much. And okay. what's also cool is above this averages table, there's another button called show filter. And here, this is another piece of technology, which we've reused all over the site. And that uses Scryfall syntax to filter uh, collections of cards. If I I show filter and I say T colon creature, now it's only going to calculate the average ELO for creatures. So now all of a sudden, green has the highest average ELO. Once again, it's like these collection of tools that I want them to be flexible enough that you can do whatever you want with them. And so everything is built with this modular design philosophy. And so going down the list of analytics, uh, you have table. And table has two categories, columns and rows, and these use the sort types. And this is all super useful information to cube designers. And once again, you can filter the input cards into this and customize all these as you want. Then we have the chart, which it's pretty similar information as the average table, except it displays the characteristic on the chart. Yeah, so it makes this bar graph. Yeah, so if you want to look at the CMC, like the curve visually, you can do that. You can also like look at ELO visually. That's usually interesting. Um, if you set the group by to unsorted, you'll see this really nice looking bell curve, if usually. <laughs> If it, if it looks like a, like a valley, um, you might have some issues. <laughs> okay, right. That's funny. Yeah, that's, that's cool. 
So this graphing feature, charting feature, is something that we associate with lots of magic sites. Even like deck building sites will often offer some version of this. But in those cases, it's almost invariably going to be charting, mana curve, and maybe like um, types and super types and that kind of thing is possible as well. But here you've got just this dizzying array of options, the grouping by and the characteristic options. So you can you can really look at all different kinds of data in a granular way, and in this case, represent it visually in interesting ways. This really exciting feature um, that's next is the recommender. And this recommender, there was a contributor who came and he has some machine learning. He, he's a machine learning engineer and he wanted to do some. So he asked if for the source data for like cube and deck objects for cube Cobra. And in return, he wanted to build this recommender model. And so I, I said, sure, let's go for it. And so I've been working with them over the last month or so on this feature. And this this is this is a game changer. This is really something that has not been attempted before. And I think the results are incredible. What this does is it looks at all cubes and has some sort of model to determine how much cards should belong in that cube based on what other cubes that are similar to it, cards that, that they include. And then it looks at your cube and it says, what are the outliers in your cube? Well, you should probably cut these cards. So if, if I uh, look at mine, for example, it tells me to cut Jaya's greeting. And that's because most cubes that are similar to mine don't run this card. It's a very uncommon card and that makes sense. Like my reasoning for running this card is very specific. I wanted to reduce the reach of red aggressive decks without reducing the power of red spells. And I think Jaya's Greeting is actually pretty solid. It's an instant, does three damage, and you get a little scry. And it, it, it does the job in aggressive decks to clear the way. And it, it makes the aggro decks need to focus more upon combat than the arbitrary reach that they get once like mid-range decks turn the corner. So that, that, that was um, one thing I, I did with my cube. And I see in the recommended editions, I see burst lightning. So it really wants me <laughs> to add in this, this burn back. I see kitchen things as recommended, deep analysis, chain lightning. I see cruel celebrant. That one's interesting. It probably thinks I want cruel celebrant because I have like an aristocrat style deck. But one thing I specifically did is I have aristocrats really only viable in red black. Most people, most cubes probably that support a lot of the aristocrats' cards, probably like Blood Artist and Carrion Feeder, they probably have Cruel Celebrant there, but I happen to not have that. And the classic aristocrats' colors are black, white, and, and red, but in your environment, you're supporting it in exactly Rakdos. There, there, there are good reasons for that, but uh, I, mean, I have. Maybe, I think they're good reasons, but I, I, I don't want the... the player adjusting that deck to be spread thin across the color pie. I, I want them to be able to draft the archetype and not have to worry about their mana base as much. Like if, if this archetype exists in three colors, then you're kind of punished. Like you, you're priced into getting good fixing as well. And then it just makes the draft more, it, it decreases the decision trees when you're drafting. And that's one thing I try to avoid. That was, that was my logic for cutting white aristocrats. And so the recommender, it's, and once again, the recommender can be filtered. Um, so if, if I say CI colon white, now I have all the uh, cards with the white color identity. And so now that it cuts, it wants me to cut triplicate spirits and increasing devotion because most cards, most cubes don't usually play these really expensive tokens cards, but that that's something I include. And it wants me to, I can see all the, recommended white cards. So if I need some uh, inspiration for some spice or ideas for cards that I might want to add to this cube, it's, it's really easy for me to hop in this recommender and add this filter and to try to see what's going on. So that, that's one thing I really like as well. Yeah, that's a super cool feature. And I just want to give it a, a shout out to Ryan Sachs. He's the yes. uh, person who's been who's been working on this. 
I've been chatting with him some. We've been talking in kind of a vague way. We haven't moved forward much on this, but in collaborating on a video project where he would explain the logic that underpins the recommender and explain how the machine learning stuff works, which was fascinating to learn on a phone call with him a week or two back. Oh, I would love to see that video. (laughs) Yeah, the recommender, it's super exciting. I haven't seen anything like this. And its application reaches beyond simply like the average cube lists like one might see elsewhere. Because you've probably seen on other websites, there'll be a periodically updated average cube. That's the average 360 powered cube. That's an aggregate of all the cubes on the site or whatever. And then you can see what cards people commonly include or commonly exclude from their lists. But this recommender um, is taking your list and looking at other cubes that are similar and that in fact have similar goals, such that this recommender can even identify things like set cubes, I mean, very particular environments. I've tried it out on a Ravnica block cube I've been developing for KubeCon. And my goodness, it was giving me Ravnican cards to include from all the different Ravnica blocks. And I had kind of fudged a few cards and included some cards not from Ravnican blocks, but that had Ravnican flavor text or, you know, cited the City of Guilds in its art or something. And the recommenders telling me to cut those (laughs) cards I was fudging. I was blown away that it doesn't just take a list and say, this is a legacy list. And here's some cards that one might include in a legacy list, but it develops context. It's crazy. It it honestly constantly surprises us how how well it works. If, If you do like a one cmc cube where every card is one cmc it'll recommend you one cmc cards yeah that's crazy you get the page very far back and then you start seeing two cmc cards so it definitely understands the concept of converted mana cost one thing it doesn't pick up on is cubes that emit certain colors so i've seen like grixis cube or jund cube it doesn't do as good of a job for that and i I think it kind of makes sense because it's a lot easier to contextualize curves because a curve is a aspect all cubes have some have a lower curve some have a higher curve some have a very you know specific like only one drop curve i've seen a cube that only has lands so that's is definitely a characteristic of a cube that it can be picked up on but color the color distribution of cubes like 99.9 percent of cubes has basically the same color distribution maybe an area for improvement maybe something we have to concede to and say only, if you want to only get recommendations for certain colors just use the filter yeah that's a good idea and another thing is it, it it's not just cubes that are similar to you like if you have lexi cube that doesn't have splinter twin it's not going to recommend you kiki jiki and the twin combos but the moment you add one of those then it will start recommending you to add Kiki Jiki and because it, it picks up that these cards have a very high correlation with these other cards. Like it, right. it, it can see um, like very, very high synergistic card combos and that will influence the suggestions as well. So that, that was really cool. That's a super cool concept. And it seems to me, this was something I talked about very briefly with Ryan too, but future applications of this seem awesome. Maybe one could use the technology behind the recommender to establish relationships between cubes in some programmatic way, whereby one could sort of generate relational clouds of cubes and show which ones are closer to others in design. I don't know what all uses this could be put to, but it seems like the most basic use is you could find other cubes that don't just share cards with you, but share some philosophical underpinnings from which you can get inspiration or see how cubes are related to each other. Like maybe there's a lot of people who are starting from the Moto Vintage Cube, and then you can track some network of how cubes have diverged over time from Moto Vintage Similar cubes is definitely something on the radar. So maybe something on Overview... I, I'm not sure where to put it, but have some some somewhere on one of the cube pages that kind of has a short list of similar cubes, so you can kind of navigate throughout the site in this way. That that would be super cool, and that's something I, I'd like to add. Mm-hmm. Possibly, this technology could be used to develop an entirely new way of schematizing cubes. We cube designers, I'm sure we have all run into this issue. We struggle with how to define our cubes. So we've got old tools that I still use, uh, which is language like legacy and vintage. 
or rarity restrictions like pauper and peasant and, and so on. So we use these as shorthands for trying to describe the environment. But as well, we all know, well, these descriptions don't capture our environments in any particularly meaningful, detailed way. It's really quite surface level description. So the more we can generate a really robust relationships between cubes and understandings of what kinds of cubes there are and how they're doing similar or different things. Maybe this would allow us to have some programmatic way of getting at new labels for cubes that are going to be more contentful, more meaningful ways of representing our environments. Yeah, I, th I think that's a discussion you'll have to have with Ryan Sachs. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is a cool thing. The recommender, it's not just recommending you. I mean, what the recommender is doing is recommending you cards that you might want to include or that you might want to cut from your environment. But I'm underscoring your point, Gwen, that this is a game changer. And this isn't even my world at all, this data science stuff and machine learning. But I, I feel like I have some glimmer of possible horizons that the recommender may open up. It's exciting. One feature we have as well on the playtest tab is you can specify custom draft formats. So if I go over to um, all my cubes, I, I can see that I have some draft sims for like Modern Horizons and um, Eldraine. Uh, actually, I, I really went all out with this one. So even the foil card has the foil overlay if you, if you get a foil card in the pack. So I, I made it very, very accurate. Uh, so if you go to Ask Fans, and I'm just going to order by unsorted and draft format. I'm going to say authentic ELD draft. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to filter it by the type knight. And now I can see the average number of knights I expect to see. So this is kind of a lever that Magic R&D actually uses like to balance themes and archetypes in draft formats is of this type of cards. What is the expected number that players will have access to per pack. And that's something that you can extend to cube. If I want to support a particular archetype, maybe I, I have a tag on all cards that belong in this deck. I can now look at the as fan for that card uh, very easily. Uh, so one, one of the other cubes that I'm bringing to KubeCon is called the Unreasonable Cube. And it is named appropriately. <laughs> yeah. This you worked on with uh, Zach Halpern, as I ever recall. Yes, yeah, um, from MTG JSON and Cockatrice, yeah. We built this cube, and the idea is it uses all the a lot of mechanics from the silver-bordered sets, but it tries to do so in a way that creates a draft format that still operates in the rules of magic. So we don't have dexterity cards and cards that affect outside the game. We don't have any of that nonsense, but we do have things like Augment and Host and... Um, crank and whatever yeah yeah, yeah uh, contraptions and, and so we do have that nonsense so one thing that i really want to do is i want to match the ass fan for contraptions i want to match the ass fan for hosts and augments for my queue to the actual unstable draft environment because i know wizards you know has these numbers they they figured this out they've been doing this a lot longer than i have and they've been pretty successful with figuring out what kind of numbers you need to have these draft ar archetypes. Uh, my numbers, I use this to very closely match theirs. So even with limited test data, I know, well, I'm gonna get the same number of, of cards with these characteristics to enable this sort of deck as the this actual draft format. So that's super useful. Yeah, that's great. In uh, the Ravnica cube I was talking about that I've been working on, all three Ravnican blocks are uh, represented. And I did something similar to what you're describing in that I made sure that the ass fan of the gold cards in the cube matched the ass fan of gold cards in RNA and GRN sets, Guilds of Ravnica and so on, the, the recent Ravnica sets, so that I hope that for players of the cube, when they're cracking packs, it feels very Ravnican. The density of gold cards, which are so important to the Ravnican experience, the guild cards is going to be very similar to what they might expect. You were talking about density of knights and so on. I remember reading an article by Mark Rosewater at the time of um, when Dragons of Tarkir was coming out, when he was looking back at Dragon's Maze from Return to Ravnica block and talking about how disappointed people were that you've got this uh, set called Dragon's Maze and yet there's practically no dragons in it. There's like Niv-Mizzet or something and that's it, right? <laughs> so when they come to make a set called Dragons of Tarkir, he said, we wanted to make certain 
that if we were promising dragons in the title of the set, people were going to get dragons, which meant we needed to pay real attention to the ass fan of creature type dragon in packs so that people are opening dragons, darn it. And he made the good observation that what his mantra is, if your theme doesn't appear at common, it's not in fact your theme. That's that's one thing we don't have in cube is, well, usually is is rarity. So Mm -hmm. like in a normal set, if I have some common cards that belong to an archetype, that really impacts the ass fan. But for cube, I can't do that. I have to actually just add a flat number of cards to bump up this ass fan. Removing and adding, you know, one card is going to impact the ass fan in a very linear way. Yeah. But like you say, you can still control ass fan. Even if you're not, con- even if you're one of the levers of control, isn't rarity. So I love that you include Asfan as a mode of analysis here. I think this is still an underused way of thinking about cube for a lot of people. I want to single out a few content creators who deserve special approbation. Daquan Watson and Brian Allen recently released the 35th episode of the Color of Magic podcast. And their exposition of how better to combat racism in magic is timely, vigorous, and necessary. Colleagues from the Austin, Texas magic scene who are politically engaged advocates for people of color and LGBTQ communities host the Spike Feeder podcast. And finally, my friend Usman Jumil requires no introduction. But despite his brilliant tenure as a theorist of Cube, he has long weathered resistance rooted in racism. See the show notes for links to work by all these fine people. Tokens have been around basically untouched for a long time, and it just shows you all the tokens in your cube. This was such, such a largely requested feature, probably more than any other feature. Like every release I did, people were asking, oh, this is so good, but can you please, can you please add tokens? I want to see the tokens for my cube. And I I was, I had such a hard time trying to figure out how to do this. I just didn't do it. And a contributor just said, you know what? I'll do it myself. So oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he, uh, a contributor came in and he built this entire thing, the UI, the back end. And that was his first contribution. And it, it took him a while, but we have a really open development culture. Like we, we help each other. I started this project with so little knowledge and I learned so much along the way. And so my attitude towards new contributors is very much the same. It's okay if you have zero experience. If you haven't written a line of code before, you wanted to learn some JavaScript, you're welcome here. We will hold your hands and help you get this thing set up and get this very simple feature, you know, and then you have, will have a, a tangible contribution to this project. We'll help you do it. And, and that was kind of the story with this guy. It's I helped him understand the code base and we, you know, we worked through some of the quirks of how we handle card data and um, he built this entire thing and, and it's uh, held up quite nicely. Um, tag cloud is, if you use tags for your cube, it's like a word cloud for tags. I don't really use this one, um, but I've had people who use tags heavily um, really give this one a lot of praise. Pivot table is a new one that it was my idea to have, and I'm not sure how useful it is because I haven't had a single person comment on it. I think uh-huh. it's super cool. Yeah, I messed around with it a little bit. You'd brought it up to me the other day and you were like, check this thing out. So I, I checked it out and I can totally see the utility of it. It seems awesome. Anyone super like into Excel is probably familiar with Pivot Table and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's Pivot Table for your cube. If you're looking, if you're not familiar with Pivot Table, uh, this is probably not the best form <laughs> to, to explain what Pivot Table looks it is, a, it is a bit complicated to use. But I, I encourage you to look it up and um, see what it's about because because it, it's super cool. So the next one is interesting and nobody asked for this, <laughs> but I built it anyway. <laughs> I don't even know why nice. I built this because this isn't a tool that I use at all. Because you watched a video by your good friend, John, AKA Cultic Cube, <laughs> and you were like, my goodness, we have to have this. this <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, th- that was a contributing factor, but. I, I have heard a lot of voices in the Q community talk about this is a tool that people like to use. And they mm-hmm. always ha- show me screenshots from the same website. And yes. I just thought, you know, let's let's just put it on Cubecrober. Why not? Yeah. So, so, so this is a hypergeometric calculator, by the by, is, yeah, is what it's, this it's, thing is. It's exactly what's outlined in your video, but there's a little more to it. So there's also, after you put in some data, there's a little bit of a plotter tool. 
And so this graphs probabilities, and you can change the x axes, and you can create multiple data sets and compare the data sets against each other and change the yeah, x axes. Super cool. So yeah, I think it's cool. But once it again, it's awesome. I don't know how useful it actually is. Well, it's super. It's super super useful, dude. It's. Um... I mean, it is for me anyway, and for many of our colleagues, as you say, this comes up in the community all the time. <laughs> go, go watch Colter Cube's video on hypergeome analysis. <laughs> yeah, right. So this this helps you to figure out if you want to ha reliably have three lands on turn three and your forty card limited deck, then hypergeometric probability allows you to figure out. Well, what does reliably mean to me? Does that mean I want to have a 90% chance to have three lands on turn three? Does that mean I want to have a 60% chance? And then you can figure out how many lands that you need to run in the deck in order to achieve that 90% chance of whatever your bar is. So do you need to run 17 lands or 18 lands? Or And then this is useful in cube design because you might want to solve a question like how many uh, red one drop creatures do I need in the cube in order to have drafters reliably see X number, you know, eight of them or something at uh, the draft table in the packs that they open. So hypergeometric calculator is something that I personally use uh, all the time. It's something that I use very regularly in my cube design. So I love that you have included it and I don't have to use that uh, stat track interface, which is the website that everybody's used for forever, and it's awkward and ugly, and it definitely doesn't do this plotting that you've introduced here, which is super cool. Yeah, so that that's it for the um, the analysis. Maybe we can move on to the playtesting component. I got to say that your draft bots have gotten just better and better by leaps and bounds. It's super exciting. And you have continued to develop the interface for building decks in interesting ways. And it sounds like you've got more ideas about how to do that. And a thing I've been bugging you about is you've talked about the possibility of having multiplayer drafting on here. So like have m multiple humans be able to draft a pool and then also have you know, bots fill in empty seats or something if you don't have enough people. I'm super excited about that, although you've told me to like tone down my expectations and that's not coming tomorrow or anything. It's not coming tomorrow. I, I spent a lot of time on this and there's a lot of technical challenges involved um, related to our infrastructure. And I am making progress. Um, nice. And I have a prototype, but I'm really unhappy with it. And it's not, it's very far from production ready. In fact, I'm probably going to have to scrap all the progress um, just because it doesn't work well with our current infrastructure. If you want to hear updates on this, you can um, follow me on Twitter. I post all my updates there. If you're really eager to, to know the moment this feature goes live, it is coming. I don't have an ETA. I thought it would be sooner. I thought I could beat Arena to it, but I did not beat Arena to it. <laughs> so Yeah. Uh, well, Arena still doesn't support your cube or mine, so... There's that. And um, I've, we've got our friend, uh, Zach Halpern, whom we mentioned a few minutes ago. He is the mind behind draft.info, DR, and then the number 4FT.info, which is a technology that allows one to do exactly this thing that we're describing here. You can draft with other humans and fill in bots. Yeah. I've actually worked with them a little bit recently um, to oh, yeah. create an integration. So if, if you go on, it's very recent. If you go on um, draft right now, draft.info, you can then click cube. You can put in your Cobra ID and it'll immediately uh, import your list, which is, I actually did a cube draft with my friends in uh, Seattle. I'm in Boston. And I did some cube draft with my friends in Seattle uh, last Saturday. It was great. It worked very seamlessly. Oh man, that's great. I saw that I saw that just the other day that, you know, that feature was there. And I use draft.info myself. I've shared this with Zach. I've got a couple of years, I'd been living in California for more than 10 years. And a couple of years ago, I moved back to Texas. And I've still got, of course, all these friends back in California with whom I cube drafted. One way we've been able to kind of keep that relationship going and do the thing we've loved is via draft.info. But I want Cobra to do it, darn it, because um, I want to be able to have everything in-house on Cobra yeah. thing A. If we 
do it on Cobra, you get a lot of advantages. Like we have, um, I think our deck build was a lot better. Yeah. For example, I think our draft interface, I, I like more. Uh, mm -hmm. You can move things around and whatnot. I, I think our, our export breadth is a lot wider. We support a lot more formats. Yeah. And so being able to do multiplayer judgment would be nice. But. Yeah. And the AI is like a huge thing. My sense is Cube Cobra's AI is, you know, much more advanced at this point than the draft.info AI is. Well, I'll say this um, for a long time. So one thing I, I like to do, I, I, I mean, especially at the beginning, is I would go on Reddit, I would go on other discords, and I would just search Cobra, search references for Cobra. Yeah. And I, I dig through all the all the comments, and I, I want to see what people are saying about my site. <laughs> yeah. And it made me so sad. Oh yeah, oh, <laughs> like, no. like the responses I, I get when I post a new release or generally interact with people, it's overwhelmingly positive. But I guess behind my back, man, people flame the AI so much. It's so so disheartening because I spent so much effort trying to get these draft bots in a good state, and yeah. it's such a hard problem to solve. It and is. I, I've seen people complain that they don't pick enough lands. Oh, from my cube, they're they're not drafting the curve correctly. They're not valuing this card type, things like that. And it's this is such a hard problem to solve because if it was a set draft, that that would be trivial. The amount of data out there and the possibility size is just minuscule. It's like microscopic compared to the possibility space of cube. Right. It it just it's unbelievably like the the scale of cube drafts. It's it's enormous. Like you think you have forty five cards, you know that that you open at any table out of the forty six thousand cards in Magic, and you need to write some code that <laughs> accurately picks you know, coherently. And we've gone through a number of revisions. And and my my attitude towards this after I got to a certain state is these draft bots they. They're fine for what they are. Don't think that they're authentic. They're going to be like a player because I, the amount of time it takes for me to improve the draft bots, I don't feel like is worth it for the amount of time I have. I, I would much rather spend 10 hours building a new feature that has a much more you know physical, tangible impact than working 10 hours on the draft bots and marginally improve their realism. That that's my kind of philosophy towards it. But other contributors have stepped in and made small changes that have kind of um, compacted over time. And eventually, I want to get to a machine learning solution. And I have talked to Ryan Sachs about this quite a bit. And yeah. we have plans, but not anytime soon. We're still in the phase of we need more data. We have yeah. 300,000 drafts worth of data. A lot of those are not usable because they're like one pick or whatever. We need like an order of millions if we want to realistically do this. So we're getting there. Um, we're definitely having a good amount of data, but even when we have the data, that's only part of the problem. Yeah, and Ryan's worked on a solution like this for um, Theros, uh, Theros mm -hmm. Beyond Death um, draft. So, but yeah. I understand that's a set like you're describing. But just to say, people are going to complain, A, <laughs> B, look at Arena, my goodness. Here we've got this product from Watsi, and they, more than anybody else, have this massive amount of play data. And despite that, people complain all the time about the Arena bots and how stupid they are at, at draft, right? The, mm -hmm. So even there, you know. It's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. It's and a then, really hard problem. Yeah. And then C, you know, we did some pack one, pick ones at the beginning of this episode here a little bit ago. And you and I are two people who have long experience with Cube. And we have got, you know, we've got different opinions. We've got different ideas. We're pick one, pick one in different cards. And I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong. You know, we've each got our own drafting predilections. So it's going to be super hard <laughs> to come up with uh, a draft uh -huh. AI that everybody is going to say, oh, yeah, that's the correct pick that the bot is making every time. Yeah, so... The, the current state I'm actually pretty happy with because uh, so what, what one contributor added is it looks at the cards in the cube and it derives what colors are available. And that's super interesting. If it sees there's a three color card or there's a lot of like two color cards, then 
it knows I can play this three color deck. So you may have noticed that after a recent update, the bots have started drafting three color decks and that was that update. So the bots will actually like, I sometimes they'll draft the monocolor deck, sometimes they'll draft the three color deck. And it also ha is like a um, function of the amount of fixing they see. So it's actually it looks pretty good. And there's obviously still like issues, like they, they don't detect specific interactions. Um, they don't draft for archetypes, but for a play test draft and like simulating like what kind of cards you'll see at the table, it's not bad. No. And the ELO, oh my goodness, the ELO update for the draft bots was huge. That was that was a game changer. Like before we were using average pick order to, to rank how the bots pick cards. And then we were weighting it by like the colors that they're preference towards. But now it's like they dynamically pick their colors based on the fixing they see. They have a boost towards fixing. So they value fixing, you know, at a flat level higher. Then they weight what colors they want to be in based on like what cards you have in the cube. And they have this contextualized rating using ELO. From my knowledge, that's something that hasn't been done before. I'm pretty happy with where they're at now. It's, it's, I think it's not going to be as good as a machine learning solution, but they've they've come a long way. Another cool thing about the draft experience is that when one generates a pack, it's generated from a random seed, which is made available to the user, such that the user can then send the seed or send the link to a particular pack to a friend. That's kind of a separate feature than the playtest draft. You can't like seed a, a draft yet, but we actually have a change coming that you can seed a draft. So that is coming, but you can uh, seed a sample pack. So you can do like you said, if you go on the playtest tab for your cube, you can type in any piece of text here in the view sample pack seed and you click view seeded. And that is gonna be the same for that version of that cube. So if you change a card in the cube, the pack is gonna change. But if you don't change um, the cube, that pack is gonna be the same for that seed. And that's super cool because I can share the link and then my friend now has access to that image, um, which is cool. You, you can also download the image and you can post that on Twitter. If you share the link and post it on Twitter, it has uh, metadata, so it pulls that image in does the same for Discord. So the, the sample pack is just super robust. I'm very it happy is. with it. And then another cool thing about the playtesting is a couple of cool things. You, you can clone drafts. I think that's true, right? So that you can- That is true, yes. Allow a friend to draft the same pool as you. And you can, separate from this or alongside this, you can look at a pick history. You can see all of the packs and the picks that you made, the picks that the bots made. Uh, you can like sit in different seats. There's a draft viewer, you know, just like WOTC provides us with at, at high level coverage type things. So that's a cool thing. So then if your buddy drafts the same pool, you know, you can compare the picks you make and see where you ended up and why and so on. I love that. There's also pretty new. Um, I think I must have added it like last month or maybe the month before that. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. But so on the actual deck, you can do a lot. You can export to like, we have six different formats, including Arena, including Moto, Xmage, Forge, just card names, Cockatrice, a lot of platforms that people actually play these games on. And I've known people, you know, go and draft an Arena cube, just, you know, against the bots, download their deck to Arena, then put their deck in Arena and then play on Arena with each other. And yeah, that's, that's super cool. cool. Yeah. You can clone and rebuild the deck. So if you want to play around with what somebody else drafted, you can rebuild the deck. There's redraft, which like you said, I can share this and say, this is the exact same scenario that you had when drafting the deck. And it's actually the state of the ELO rankings is actually saved to the draft. Oh, wow. Huh. So yeah. So the bots will make the same decisions. Right. Even if you drafted it from like a year ago, unless we like update the AI and then, you know, but... <laughs> But if, if we haven't updated the AI, they'll make the same decisions, um, which is really cool. So you can pick the same cards a year later and well, a year later, the website is gonna be completely different, right? Yeah. With, with our feature velocity, it's absurd. Like you said, there's the deck view, then there's the deck, the pick by pick breakdown, which I love. And by the way, this was a nightmare to get right. Oh, really? <laughs> this was so, so finicky to like tweak and get to work for like all the custom drafts with like different pack sizes and different, you know, number of, oh man, it was so hard to get right. I also have like a sample hand, 
module, which is neat. That's super cool. Yeah, that's come a long ways, the whole playtesting component of the thing. Do you remember the deck view on launch? It was just a grid of card images in the order that they oh, drafted the cube. Oh, yeah, totally. I don't think that I used that feature very much at that point. I must have been, I must have just been waiting for it to get still awesomer. What are, what are some of the things that you're most excited about that are coming up for Cube Cobra? Things that you're working on? Um, the thing I'm working on a lot right now that's um, been taking so much more work than I expected is I want to improve the card analytics pages. This is one of the pain points to decide, in my opinion, is you can't really get to them easily. If you like are looking at your cube and you click a card, you see the modal, this little window with all the attributes, there's a little button at the bottom that says view card analytics. Mm. And that brings you to a page that tells you some information about a card. And you can actually like go on Scryfall um, and if you go on any card in Scryfall, the homepage, I'll click Dawn of Hope. I see down here under toolbox, card stats on Cube Cobra. That'll bring me to the same page. It, it'll tell me it's played in how many cubes. Uh, so I see Dawn of Hope is played in 6.3% of all cubes total, 700. It's mostly played in modern cube. I can see, I can see it's also significantly more popular at 540 plus cube size. That's usually the case, but there's a big jump from 8% at 450. I can see the price, the ELO, and I can see all the cards it's often drafted with. So this Dawn of Hope is often drafted with a Johnny's Pride mate. That makes sense. Yeah. I guess Dawn of Hope supports like a life gain theme. So people draft it with a life gain. Right. I, I, I That's not how I would play the card for what it's worth. Um, but people like their life gain, I guess. And then there's also some interesting things. There's a button called cubes with this card. I recently changed how this works. It used to show you like 15 random cubes. Um, but I, I reworked the search. I, I, I think I made the search really robust recently. And it'll show you a list of all cubes that you can page through with this card. And I, I, can, I can add a card to this. I can type, well, what if I play Dawn of Hope and, I don't know, Black Lotus. And now I can see there's only 28 cubes that play both these cards. And that's super cool. And I want to go further. So... I have a lot of the infrastructure in place and a lot of the data for this, but this card page, I, I want it to be like EDH rec. Like mm -hmm. often draft with is cool. It has like a pile, of, like a list of card images. And like I mentioned earlier, this looks like the early deck view when I first launched Cube Cobra. It's just like very basic, but I wanted like sorted by type. I want to see what are the highest synergy cards? What is, you know, staples? What are the creatures? What are, you know, break it down into these categories. And I want to view history for this card. How has the ELO of this card changed over time? That's all data we have access to. And that, that's something I want to show. How has the play rate of this card, you know, changed over time? Did it take a huge hit during the most recent release because it got an upgrade somewhere else? Did it get a huge boost because all of a sudden it's a two card combo? That stuff I think is super interesting to see. And so I want to have graphs on here. I want to have more stats. I want to have better organized uh, related cards. I have a lot of the stuff flushed out, but it's probably not going to be ready for next release because it's going to require some infrastructure changes. Yeah, that'd be super cool. And I like the idea of the cubes with this card thing and your attention to uh, making a search deeper and sort of easier for getting to other cubes. Because I think an issue often is that people's cubes feel sort of siloed. At least they do to me. Unless I know a particular cube, I'm unlikely to arrive at another cube. You know what I mean? Each cube kind of feels as if it exists in its own space. I totally know what you mean. And that's that's a huge pain point that I had with Cube Tutor, mm -hmm. honestly. I found myself just clicking the recently drafted cubes and just looking at random cubes. Yeah. That, that That's like the only way I knew how to like get inspiration. But now I have access to all these different cubes and I can I have so much more control over what I'm looking at. I can, I can click the advanced under cube search and now I can look at category, number of cards greater than this value, number of decks, so I can see what are some popular cards. I can look search by owner name. So maybe I, I want to look at your cubes. I'll just type in call to cube and I'll, I'll see uh, all your cubes. And I feel like search has been a pain point on my site for a while as well. This was only updated in the recent months, but before the old search was like, oh, it was such garbage. I don't know if you remember it, Yeah. but I, it's like the UI was just like, 
bunch of text on a page. It's like the there's two search bars, one for user, one for cube name. Yes, yeah, it didn't I remember really that. work half the time. It didn't turn up your cubes. Like it's super inconsistent. I, I wasn't sure why, but uh, the the new system is, is super robust and it's really cool. The development of this website, it just moves so fast because the people behind it are so passionate about this. That's why I love working on this. Anyone who's been following KubeCobra so far has known the velocity of the features has been overwhelming. Yeah, for sure. Like we launched last summer and we were like, eventually we're going to have more features than Cube Tutor. Uh huh. Eventually, you know? Right. And now I, I'm looking at, at like my backlog of issues and I'm like, are we there? Do have we exceeded the features? I, I don't know. <laughs> there's still, but there's still so much I want to do. It seems like you exceeded the features in a matter of the, you know a few short months or something. It's even true, I think, that when I did that review, I, I guess in August we decided it was. Mm -hmm. I feel like within a matter of a week or two or something, the review was outdated, and you'd already addressed a number of important things that I'd talked about there. That, that also was not an accident. A lot of those issues you brought up, I looked at it and thought, huh, that's a good point. And then I immediately fixed it. <laughs> uh, yeah. A lot of like the bigger stuff, right. like the larger features, th those kind of took more time. Things like cube compare, oh, that was such a huge feature. Yeah, and that's important. The cube comparison thing, that, that's a super, super useful feature to have. And that's one that I think a lot of people use and appreciate. I love it. I think that's the true power of open source. Open source in such a passionate community is just such a powerful thing. You had done a huge amount of work um, even before that happened, but it's great to hear that you've got this committed community of developers and you've developed a committed community of users as well in that, I mean, I, I feel like everybody who's introduced to Cobra almost immediately becomes an adherent of Cobra. You know, people should use whatever solution makes sense to them, and that's super cool. But I, for one, am I'm definitely on Cobra and have been since we talked in July and haven't looked back. It's a cool tool. I love it. And it's a, I know it's a labor of love. It's just, I'm sure, an insane amount of work for you and your fellow developers. So I appreciate that. Thank you for all of this work that you've done for the Cube community. I appreciate hearing that. It's it's weird in a way. Like it feels really rewarding, but like I I'm I'm not actually getting anything out of this. Right. Um, all the funding goes to hosting costs. It's just something that I care about a lot. There's just some satisfaction um, that comes with providing a tool that so many people are using. Awesome. Well, that's cool. Well, I appreciate the update on Cube Cobra, the history of where it's come from, and your engagement in it. Why this passion project is a passion for you. So, thank you for your insights, Gwen. I love the site. I really appreciate your work on it, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes from here. Great to hear your feedback, and I promise that there is so much more coming. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>